Hi, it's Steve Hargadon, and welcome to the closing keynote of the 2017 Global Education Conference. This is a delight. We have David Bornstein and Taylor Nelson here, and we're so appreciative of them being here. David's on webcam, for those of you who can see. Uh, we'll, we'll let them come on in a second, but thanks first to our sponsors and supporters who allow this grassroots shoestring event to take place. Special appreciation to participate, Cutter Foundation, Digital Promise Global, and Taking It Global this year. Okay, those of you who are in the room, you can indicate where you're participating from. Look to the left of the map. You're looking for the star icon. You can click on the map and put a note in the chat. Let us know time and temperature. Anything else that would be fun? We're not seeing Nepal light up, and so it must be that Govinda has gone to bed. <laughs> Thomas and Guam, as the day shifts, our participants shift. Chicago, Qatar, New Mexico, <coughs> excuse me, Panama. Ukraine, how fun. Greece. Okay, we're going to move over and allow David and Taylor to start. Thank you both for being here. Really appreciate it. Thanks for having us. So, uh, well, you, hello, everybody. Did you say you something, Steve? Sorry. Slides, you know how to move the slides forward? Just go with the arrow, the arrow buttons? Not perfect. Yeah, I can, I can find that. Okay. Well, hello, everybody. Thanks very much for joining us. Uh, I'm here uh, with my colleague, Taylor Nelson, in New York City. And uh, we thought we would, um, we, we wanted to talk to you about this, um, this new resource that, that we've created with, with educators called Solutions U. And I uh, thought I'd just give you a little bit of background about, about uh, myself and Taylor. Uh, we work together in an organization called the Solutions Journalism Network. And um, the purpose of our organization is we work with news organizations around the world to train them and, and get them to see the value of doing rigorous reporting that looks at how people are trying to solve social problems so that people around the world on a regular basis don't only just hear about the dysfunction when they turn on the news, but they also hear the different responses uh, that are emerging around the globe uh, to a whole range of problems, and that fuels their imagination and creativity as well as their need to be aware of concerns. So we've worked with hundreds of news organizations and produced or helped them produce thousands of stories. And the purpose of Solutions U is to say, how can, in a world of rapid change where, where people have to be um, continually innovating in order to adapt to changing circumstances, what are the implications for education uh, in terms of bringing in uh, much greater awareness of these adaptations that are occurring around the world so that young people, when they're learning about uh, learning how to be critical thinkers, can be um, sort of in some ways real-time scholars of social innovation as it's happening around, around the globe? Um, so just a little bit of background about myself. I'm, I, I started uh, my career uh, 25 years ago as a journalist and I became an author. And I've written uh, a number of books about social innovation. I uh, spent five years writing about microfinance, uh, writing about the Grameen Bank. I was in Bangladesh for a year uh, doing that research. Uh, then I spent uh, another five years writing a book about social entrepreneurs in 10 countries, looking uh, at a lot of Ashoka fellows around the world and wrote a book called How to Change the World. Um, and then just recently, in the last couple of years, wrote another book about social entrepreneurship, really looking at some of the main questions and the changes in the field as, that, as the study of social entrepreneurship had spread um, so much. Um, in the last uh, uh, eight years, I've been writing a column at the New York Times regularly called Fixes, which looks at solutions to social problems in a rigorous way. And then most recently, over the last five years, uh, including with my colleague Taylor, we've been working in a new nonprofit network called the Solutions Journalism Network, which um, is dedicated to training news organizations, as I mentioned. And um, the basic premise of the network is that the news does not 
help people really imagine the world correctly. Um, and there's this quote by Walter Lippmann that really animates our world. The way in which the world is imagined determines at any particular moment what people will do. And the people imagine the world, uh, you know, you, you see what's happening right in front of you, but most of what happens, what we hear about in the news is mediated by a very, very profound selection bias of information that is about pathologies and dysfunctions and scandals and violence. Um, and, it, and it can create a great distortion, but it can also really uh, impoverish us in a sense of being aware of, of the kinds of things that are happening that really can really help us uh, do better. So as we've built this network over the past uh, number of years, we've been able to see journalists discovering possibilities around the world that are often hidden from view, uh, ways that people are dealing with everything from climate change to health access to improving education system, systems protecting human rights, uh, pretty much anything you can name. And one of the really interesting things that I've noticed in speaking with students, both in universities and in high schools, um, is I often ask them, you know, I give them a, a minute or two and I say, uh, write down as many problems, global social problems or national problems that you can think of, and let's see what we can come up with. And typically we can fill a blackboard in about a minute with uh, 50, 60, 100 problems in some cases. And then I say, okay, take a minute or two and write down some of the solutions that you can think of, some of the good ideas out there in the world that you think show promise against these problems. And typically in a minute or two, we might come up with, you know, four or five, maybe a half a dozen. And you look at these two sides of the blackboard, one of them jam-packed with problems and the other one with a very few uh, set of ideas about what to do. And, and, and you get that from the news, but you also get that in many cases from education too. We focus much more on criticality, on, on, on trying to understand and diagnose the ills rather than trying to understand what are the available treatments. Um, so Solutions U was really developed to try to help rebalance uh, the kinds of information that students get. Um, uh, currently, the resource is, 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 it pulls in solutions journalism from all of the organizations around the world that we have found that are practicing this. So currently there's 2,500 stories, reports in this, uh, in this platform that we've organized in a variety of ways with educators to make as useful to, to teachers as possible. Um, this resource keeps growing. Every month we're adding 100, soon it'll be two, 300 a month. So this is really keeping up with changes on the fly as they're happening. And, and once again, we, we're very rigorous about the stories that go in here. These, they have to be what we consider rigorous solutions journalism. So these are not CNN hero stories. They're not uh, press releases uh, from, from NGOs or nonprofits. These are stories that look at a problem, look at a response to a problem, look at the kind of evidence uh, about what that response is doing, and then try to understand what can be learned um, from that activity on the ground. And it's, it's very rich fodder for students and educators to think about critically what are the limitations of these solutions. Do we agree with them? Do we think that they could be scalable? What are the patterns that we're finding? Uh, what are the problems that are embedded in these, in these approaches that perhaps are unaccounted for? What are the built-in biases that might be at play? Um, so the Solutions You platform, which I'll, I'll, I'll get into and talk about a little bit in a minute, it really is, is designed to connect students and educators around the world to teaching resources that are created around the credible solutions journalism that we have found from around the globe. Um, so there's a couple of different ways that you can use the resource and I really encourage you at the, at the end of this presentation I'll show you how you can sign up for it and join this community of, of educators. Um, we have, in Taylor, my colleague Taylor Nelson has worked with um, many, many educators and really over the last two years many, many conversations asking them what are the kinds of topics, issue areas that you really want to teach and you feel that there's a missing element of solutions oriented um, curricula basically uh, to bring into your, to your classes and also the kinds of things that the students want. 
So one of the ways that the resource is set up is around topics. So you can go into many different topics. This is just a, a small selection of agriculture and food, immigration and refugees, health, as you can see here, human rights, education. Um, so say, for example, you went into to look at the, um, the issue of energy and the environment. So, so one of the things that you'll find immediately if you click on that is that there'll be a bunch of uh, collections that have been created around that. So some of those collections are created by people in the Solutions Journalism Network with our, in, in partnership with our news sources. Um, and some of them will be created by educators themselves who have sort of, it's like their own playlist of five stories that I think are, are very useful or ten stories that I think are very useful to teach a particular, uh, particular topic area. So for example, if you're looking at, uh, if you're teaching a module that's looking at energy and global warming and the environment today, typically uh, many classes ar around the world will be, will be dealing with obviously the, the risks of, of global warming, the, the problem, diagnosing the problem, explaining where, where, where it comes from, what are the various policies, um, what are the political problems that we're facing in, in terms of, of dealing with this issue. Um, what you could find here are examples of places around the world that are doing something that we could learn from. So for example, within, within this module that is, that's on the, uh, on the resource right now, Energy and the Environment, you can find some story that was, that was, that was um, reported by a news site called CityScope from India, really looking at what Indian cities are doing to build resilience against some of the threats around climate change. Um, another example would be um, the spread of micro hydro plants, uh, or, or not really plants, but micro hydro initiatives around the world, and how these initiatives are are in fact proving themselves out to be better uh, and dealing with some of the the inherent problems of the costs associated with micro hydro um, around the world. So, so this is um, you could look at that as a pattern. You could also look at the way cities, for example, New York City or Los Angeles, have developed um, internal, um, internal movements to advance green issues and so forth. And, and in fact, in the, in the solutions you resource, there are probably, I don't know the exact number, but probably three or four, three or four hundred uh, reports from around the world that deal to s in some level with global warming or with energy and so forth. So there's an enormous amount of activity around the world of people trying to grapple with this problem. And very often that knowledge is not, uh, it doesn't get into to, to classes as much as it could. Of course, obviously, it, it's, some of it's in there, but it's, it's very hard for educators in a systematic way to find these kinds of stories just using Google, for example. Um, another way that you could, you can use the solutions you resource, and this is something that was really um, asked for by educators was um, looking at the, the tactics, the success factors, the patterns that connect problems and, and the problems that connect uh, responses to problems. What are the things that people are doing uh, in common? And what you often find are these broad patterns and successes that run across solutions and and, and when, once again, when we call these things solutions, these are all responses to problems. They all have limitations. They all can use a good critical analysis. They have strengths. They have weaknesses. Um, but very often you find these tactics that run through them. So for example, um, empowering people. You will often find, um, rather than focusing on the deficits of a particular group, groups that are often considered, quote, beneficiaries, of programs or government services, you'll often find around the world people have found uh, really clever ways to flip the conception of a poor person, for example, as, as an agent of change rather than someone who needs help from above kind of thing. And you'll see this is a very, very common pattern. Microfinance, Bangladesh, the, the article, the, the book that I wrote about the Grameen Bank is a classic example of empowering people, providing resources to women villagers in Bangladesh rather than, uh, for example, traditional forms of aid. Um, so you can see some of the, there's a whole variety of success factors, getting to the root causes of problems, cultivating collaborations, how do you actually bring groups of people together. If you really want to become sophisticated about 
causing social change, being a, a world-class problem solver, these are the kinds of uh, strategic insights that could be very helpful. Creative financing, um, expanding access, different ways of expanding access. So if you go a little deeper into these success factors, I'll go a little deeper into cultivating collaborations, because that's a really important one today. Um, you'll find that within the resource there's going to be some collections there that will look at the different ways that collaborations have come together, how you can actually make that happen, um, and these stories will, will in many cases, um, you know, you could, you could find dozens of stories that look, at, that look at this particular strategic insight across issue areas, and then the stories will reveal many dimensions of the challenges, the problems, the benefits of collaborations, the political dimensions, the economic dimensions, and so forth. Really great fodder for, cl for classroom uh, conversations. Um, so for example, in this particular um, success factor collection, there is an NPR story, National Public Radio from the United States, that looked at the way that hospitals were actually creating collaborations with lawyers to help people. Oftentimes, uh, if a person comes into the hospital, let's say with asthma or with an infection, the problem might be their housing. Um, the doctor can deal with the infection, but the, it'll recur unless you get somebody to fix the housing. It turns out that lawyers are often much better to get landlords to fix housing than doctors are. So the hospitals partner with lawyers. It's a very innovative model, but, but it's hard to do that. How do you create those kinds of collaborations? Really interesting stuff to study if you're interested in, in sort of policy change or if you're interested in, in the mechanics of social innovation. Um, this is another story in that collection that looked at, um, this is from the BBC, a, a new podcast that we helped them develop that looks at how to solve social problems. It's called World Hacks. Um, and this is a collaboration between people, it's an application, an app, between people around the world who have this app who are able to help a blind person um, uh, solve some problem that they have um, basically through digital technology. So it's a really fascinating idea and the collaboration, putting together the pieces of people around the world who are the helpers and the people around the world who are the people who are re requesting assistance of a vision essentially for a temporary period through technology, building that model is, is extraordinary, extraordinarily creative. That can be studied here. Um, Another way of using the resource is just to use the search function. As I mentioned, there's now 2,500 stories in it. And you can search them through many, you can look through issue area, through the success factors, through geography. Some of the other things you can do as well are, um, you can look at a, a major sort of topic. Like in this case, I have a search looking at um, 168 stories that are solutions-oriented journalism that look at how do you uh, increase um, access to clean water or sanitation services? So that's one way you can search. Um, you could also look through um, sustainable development goals, for example. So, so sustainable development goal number two is to reduce hunger down to zero in the world. And if you are, say, teaching a class that is getting to uh, dealing with global hunger issues or, or food security, um, or perhaps you specifically want to look at the sustainable development goals, um, but you want to give students um, not too much or you want to give them a good chunk of reading, say for example, six to ten pages, you can say I want 1,500 to 3,000 word stories. You can say you would want less, you can say you want more as well, um, and then you'll get a hundred examples that fit in that category. So the idea is that you can, you can really find um, resources that fit, fit the, um, the size of the assignments you want. Um, and then, you know, if you search in this case for sustainable development goal number two, you can see where the work is being covered around the world. So if you're interested, for example, in saying, I'd like to look at the issue of hunger, but I'm interested in looking at Europe. How does it apply? How is it different in Europe as opposed to, say, sub-Saharan Africa, as opposed to, say, South Asia? You can do these comparisons uh, across issue areas, across ge geographic areas around issue areas, which is a very interesting way of contrasting and learning, you know, really developing global competencies as well because you really see how problems are shared and but also how they're very different. Um, so the teaching resources um, that wrap around all of this stuff um, are really being built now by educators who are using 
the tool and, and uploading the kinds of things that they, um, that they are creating for their own classes to be shared with others. And the more people do this, obviously the more valuable solutions you will be. So, so, so some of the resources that, that are currently there and are constantly, continuously being added to it are, um, as I mentioned, these collections. These are like playlists of well thought through, well selected stories that can be used to teach a very small subset of social change. Um, so here's a collection that looks at how do you get social change that focuses on people's assets rather than their needs or rather than their deficits, which is a very important strategic insight. Um, here's a collection around how do you use humor to advance social change. That's an interesting, it's some of the most uh, powerful social change um, tactics, particularly when it comes to fighting against uh, dictatorships, have historically used humor to, um, to uh, in fact, undermine the legitimacy and the seriousness of these, of these regimes. This was a powerful model that developed actually in Yugoslavia. Um, learning from failure, examples that really show you how failure is actually a core part of the innovation process. Um, and here's, here's um, a collection around building distribution systems, uh, which really looks at, you know, how do you take global, how do you take things that people need and really make sure that they can get out to large numbers of people uh, at different economic, uh, economic socioeconomic levels. Um, there's many collections in, this, in, the, in the resource now already, and, and we just keep adding them uh, as we go. In addition, people are also adding class assignments. They're, asking, they're, they're adding modules and, and their whole syllabus for courses so you can see how people are creating assignments, how they're grading, how they're giving students um, various ways of using Solutions U. There's how-to guides for the, for the, for the um, resource itself as well as um, assignment ideas. So for example, some of the assignments that are currently in there, um, critical thinking, for solutions-based social challenges that, you know, from, for a philosophy course. Um, ethics, ethics courses, looking at uh, using an assignment that draws on some of the, some of the reports in the, in the, in the resource to, to ask questions about what is a good life, what is a good act. Um, you have, have assignments that look at ecology, human ecology, as I mentioned, public policy. And uh, once again, you, you, this is a, obviously a, a crowdsourced idea. And so the more that people add to, to the, the store of assignments and collections and syllabus, the, the richer it becomes. Um, and there's also my colleague Taylor is also compiling case studies right now of how people are using Solutions U. Um, and then you can really look at uh, the, the particular values that people, that people are finding uh, and the limitations as well because we want to keep on making the resource better. It's certainly not perfect. It, it really just launched a, a few months ago. So um, I just want to, I'm going to close now because I want to leave a, a good amount of time for Q&A. Um, I want to mention um, a few things. One of the teachers that I, I wanted to just reference, reference her work is a professor named Marcy O'Neill at Michigan State University. And one of the things that she mentioned, um, you know, in a Q&A in &A she did online about her, her use of Solutions U is just um, that she was really inspired to use this resource for a number of reasons. Uh, one of them was very practical. She found that many times her students were quite unrealistic about what it takes to actually solve a social problem and that they were kind of uh, quite idealistic, quite optimistic, and, but also quite unrealistic about the pitfalls, about really what it takes to actually, when, it, when, it, when, it, when push comes to shove, to really make, make, move the needle on an issue. So she found that this was a very solid grounding that really set their expectations um, realistically. Um, but she also found that the students were much more exposed to the problems as they were to the solutions and that they really had a much, a very limited sense of, of the communities that were out there in the world that they could hear about and that they could actually connect to um, and in fact join and, and sort of feed their, their appetite for lifelong learning. So, um, so it was both inspiring to them, but also very pragmatic, a very pragmatic tool to, 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 to essentially help them be uh, successful and, and, and actually effective when they start getting into this work. Because the last thing you want to do is create opt-outs from social change because people think it's impossible. 
Um, and on that note, just to, the, a quote that we find uh, very useful as, as journal as a journalist myself, where journalists are not supposed to um, talk about hope. We're not in the business of making people feel good, as as I'm sure most of you know. We're more in the business of making people feel bad, it seems. Um, but it's important to have a rigorous uh, definition of hope. And one that we find congenial is this phrase that hope is a belief in the plausibility of the possible, plausible possibilities as opposed to the necessity of the probable. So there's many negative things in the world that have high probabilities associated to them, um, but there's also possibilities to create a very different world. But if people are not exposed to those possibilities, they don't see how they are plausible and how people are actually building them, there's much less of a likelihood that they will come to pass. So uh, we're, we're very hopeful that, that this resource can help more people see what's possible um, and more educators and students really find pleasure uh, in teaching through this as well. So just, just on, on, a, on a close, I'd love to ask you all uh, if you find this, this valuable to, to join SolutionsU. Um, it's a community of educators committed to supporting the critical thinking and the creativity needed to solve the world's problems through education. Um, it's very easy to do. The website is just solutionsu.org. Um, our Twitter hang handle is Team Solutions U, and you have Taylor's email and my email there at the bottom, uh, Taylor at solutionsjournalism.org, and and uh, I'm the same, David at solutionsjournalism.org. So we we really encourage you to dig dig in. Let us know. Please give us feedback. As as I say, we're we're shaping this resource around the needs of educators um, on the fly. So your feedback and your usage is the most important thing. And Taylor, do you want to add anything to that How to, at this point before we open for questions? No, David, I feel like you captured a lot of it. Um, we are just so thrilled to be here today and to talk with all of you. And your, your dedication to education and preparing students around the globe to solve problems and to be problem solvers in their own community, but also to solve problems across borders. So the hope with this resource is to provide a place where you can pull these stories so that students are not only aware of, but are critically thinking about how others are solving the world's problems. So we are thrilled to be here and excited to continue this conversation. Well, also, thank I just you. want to <laughs> yeah. Also, I want to note, we also have Catherine Noble Goodman, who is our, uh, who is the manager of our educator community and has been building out these te teaching resources. She's also on the chat as well, um, and she can answer questions, and then David and I can answer questions as well. Okay. So I see that there's some chat questions that have come in. Uh, Steve, is the best thing to do to sort of go through the chat questions now, or do you want to open up? Uh, for voice questions, what, how do we do it? So I did capture some questions and I put them in the moderator tab. And um, okay. if you want to click on that at the bottom of the chat, you can decide if there are ones there you want to address right off the bat. We can also ask people to raise their hands. There's a hand icon in the participant window, folks. If you raise that, it will raise your virtual hand and we can give you the permission to talk or you can put another question in the chat. Okay. Well, there's a bunch in the chat. Maybe I'll just read out a few out loud and, and see if we can just respond to them. Uh, David, are you teaching journalists to use maps and stories and end with call to action to point people at map and directory and says get involved? Uh, no, we're not. That's from Jennifer McCaleb. We're, no, we're, oh, maybe it's, we're not doing that. We're not teaching journalists to give out calls to action. We we think that the journalists shouldn't do that, actually, because what we find when, when they report on solutions is typically uh, we have to be quite humble. We report on things all the time that look quite good. The data comes in, seems to be working, and then six months later the data comes in and it's not working as well or the, sum, the assumptions were wrong. So we really believe that these are reports that look, you're tracking real-time innovation or efforts against some of the hardest problems in the world. We really don't know, in many cases, how well things work. You only have evidence about the past, and you only really have good evidence about the distant past. So all of these responses really have to be treated as efforts that we can learn from on the fly 
but we really can't advocate for them. And, and we really ask journalists to not get into advocacy. They shouldn't get into advocacy just because it's, um, it, you know, I've, I, as I said, I wrote about microfinance for 25 years now, and so many of the things I wrote about early in my career in the, in the 90s uh, have proven to be false or, or proven to be wrong or were very premature or the research, you know, called them into question in a number of areas. So, you know, journalism is, is a quick way to try to get information. It's not nearly as rigorous as long-term research, but it's very helpful in terms of drawing attention to new efforts uh, that are a year or two, maybe five years old, that uh, we could still learn from. Um, question about have junior high, high school students participated in this, or is it just for high school and college? Um, Journalism tends to be written at the 8th and ninth grade level of, of ELA equivalency, so I think it's perfectly appropriate for, certainly for 8th graders and probably for, for junior high school students. Uh, the resource wor works well for them. Certainly many of the stories fit. Um, okay, let's see. Um, do the solutions, this is from Peggy, George, do the solutions they come up with have an expectation that they'll have an action plan after their research. Um, not really. I think that the reporters cover this and then they will cover it again when something significant happens. Um, these can be government initiatives, they can be NGO initiatives, they can be coming from business. There's no really one, one way that these solutions emerge. Um, and then there's a great question, how often do cultural differences come up relating to applicable solutions? That is a fantastic question. It, it really relates to global competency education especially. Um, I would say all the time. <laughs> I think that one of the most interesting things that you can do with this resource is look at how what works in one place will never work in another place. Um, and so looking at what it takes to change people's behavior in one context is very, very different in another. The political situations are different. The cultural situations are different. Um, you know, it's 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 one of the most interesting ways to recognize that everywhere around the world there are competent, creative people trying to figure out how to make sense of the local, symbolic, or cultural universe to advance change. And it's it's a way to really appreciate um, the the great differences and the, and at at the same time the commonalities around the world. So that's all the moderated questions. Now maybe we can go for hand raising. Yes, so to raise your hand, again, you're looking in the participant area. There's four, there are four larger icons. You're looking for the third one over, which is the hand. I'm going to demonstrate. Click on my hand comes up. Don't be shy. <laughs> this is a great opportunity to ask a question. OK. OK, when a hand comes up. Is that David, I asked the, well, I asked the question, um, the, the original question about cultures, because I remember reading some of the Vital Smarts work and thinking about the complexity both of cultures and of human nature, and the, the just the incredible depth that you probably get of different ways that people perceive how change can happen. Yeah, that's uh, it, it's just so fascinating to see the stories um, as as they. Uh, around as they reflect different sets of expectations and cultural competencies and really worldviews, very different worldviews. Um, I think that that's one of the richest things that the, 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 the um, you know, we call these stories, right? And a story um, is typically driven by um, conflict, aspirations, people's goals. Um, and in, in sort of these stories are, you can think of them as garments they, that that uh, that uh, hold um, you know people's aspirations and that reflect their value sets um, as they're trying to achieve different things. So, for example, a story that looks at um, uh, you know what it takes, for example, to um, to uh, reduce, say. Um, infant mortality or to improve maternal mortality in different countries, you'll see that there's attitudes and different cultural practices among medical professionals, um, people sometimes who rely upon 
uh, more traditional medical medical uh, actors or, or, or health providers in communities. It, it relates to childbirthing practices, which are very culturally determined. I mean, you know, looking when you start looking into into these issues and how they play out across cultural differences, it's 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 really fascinating and it's very surprising, and sometimes quite daunting too. Kamal asks, how do you add content and who monitors the stories? So the content comes to us from, we now have a network of journalists uh, uh, around the world, and uh, these are people who are part of the, the Solutions Journalism Hub, who we've trained and so forth. And then there's lots and lots of other journalists and other people who are interested in Solutions Journalism, uh, ordinary people uh, who just want journalism to change. So they will send us things. You can anyone can enter or suggest a solutions story uh, on our on the at, at the solutions journalism site. Journalists will often tweet at us or email stories to us that they've done. Uh, individual readers will send things along, and then once they come in, we we have probably about twice as many stories that we've received as we have put in the resource, and we're pretty fickle. Uh, we have a checklist of what we think constitutes good solutions journalism. Uh, basically, uh, at least two people read each story, and, and usually more, and they look for a set of qualities. Does it really describe, is it, is it a story about a response to a problem? Um, does it marshal if there is available evidence um, about the, uh, why this particular result is noteworthy? Does it really get into the how-to problem-solving details of that, of that approach in, in real detail? It's not just a silver bullet kind of thing. Um, and does it really show the limitations um, of that approach so that it's not presenting a, a story as a as sort of pie-in-the-sky, um, you know, cure-all type of thing? Um, those are the main questions that we look at. And so we're, 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 we're trying, and we're actually probably going to be um, you know, there's some stories in there that we may have let in that we're going to be pulling out as we, we're trying to make it more and more rigorous as we go. But we have story fellows, people who work with us whose job is to read these stories, and increasingly they're going to start focusing on issue areas uh, so that they, they'll be even more um, discerning uh, by issue area. David, have there been any lessons that took you by surprise in this process? Have you learned something where you thought, oh, I, I wasn't expected? <laughs> well, you know, I mean, it, uh, for those of us who have been following the news lately, it can, it, the world can be a pretty uh, depressing place at times, or it can be presented that way. I think, you know, I, I, there's this phrase that is in my head. I heard it from someone. Um, the answer is in the room. Uh, but the room may be your state, or the room may be the, the United States, or the room may be Europe, or it may be the world. The idea that there's so much knowledge, once we start looking broadly for who has the knowledge, who's doing something smart, um, you begin to realize that we have so much practical intelligence to solve many, many, many of our social problems, and that in some places, there's always a few places, maybe it's just a handful, that are doing considerably better than everyone else for almost any problem, whether it's high school dropouts or hospital infections or housing for chronically homeless people or, you know, policy reform around equitable housing. You will find positive deviance if you look. And once you start looking and finding those positive deviants, you realize that they, that's where usually where the knowledge is that could help the whole system get better. So what, what, what's continuously surprising to me is that we have so much knowledge that is not being applied um, for so many problems, and it's not getting into the heads uh, of policymakers, of educators, of students, of investors, of you know all sorts of actors. And so the the surprise is just the opportunity for for cross pollinating this knowledge is just so exciting. So Lucy's asking, what was your process out of curiosity? For, to, uh, what's I said first? for yeah. the design of your community and your space. Like, I'm really curious as, as to what features you decided to have 
for what reason and how long did it take and I think I mean I think there's a lot of in education right now um, people are building a lot of tools and expecting teachers to come to it and where and and that can be difficult because it, it's a crowded space and then there's some organizations out there for instance I just mentioned Global Oneness which tries to get their content in lots of different educator silos like they're in their content's on PBS is teacher space and it's in Edmodo and it's in all this. I'm just curious in general, what was the process for you kind of designing your community and your space and anything special that went into that? Yeah, well, it's very participatory. I'm, I'm going to defer the question to Taylor and Catherine who are really building this community now, but it's very participatory and, and it's, um, it's really through relationships. Um, at this stage, but why don't you, Taylor, Catherine, do you want to answer the question? Sure, happy to. So this process has is, is been really powerful. We, we started the whole design of this by doing a listening tour, having, you know, groups of students on different college campuses and schools talk about, you know, how are they learning about what's working, what is that process like, having educators talk about, you know, how do we teach about what's working um, and what are some pain points that we're feeling. So we had different listening circles at campuses and schools. We had surveys and one-on-one -on -one interviews and it was this great process of trying to distill what are these big themes we're seeing when people are learning about what's working. Um, and we actually have a great blog post that sort of distills it down into four points. But the whole process of making this has been in partnerships with educators and students, hearing, you know, what it is like to teach uh, a class on environmental justice or ethics and philosophy or sociology, business, and name a different discipline. And we even had a prof um, an educator who's a chemistry professor who is excited about learning this. So the Creativity is, is boundless, just talking to different educators and seeing how these stories might be relevant and connect with their own work. Um, and we've sort of done it throughout the past two years in a lot of different conversations with individuals um, and groups of students and educators. And how we picked the different fields was we crowdsourced them, we looked at what different curriculum people were using and how could we make this database user-friendly and to make it um, an easy tool so it wasn't a hopefully a ton of orientation to sort of having your students sort of dive in and start exploring what's working. And I think in addition to that, we, we're trying to make it, you know, more community focused, more, you know, what are you or your students learning when you read these stories? What are the five stories that resonated with you and made you think differently about homelessness? or food waste or poverty or access to health care um, and sort of surface those conversations, which is what we're starting to do in the discover section of the website. Um, and in the next, I think, two months, we'll be launching it so anyone can sort of upload and submit, I want to share what I've learned and what stories resonated with me. And we're building out a lot more um, community connections. And Catherine has been an incredible cultivator of this community, working with different educators to see well, what resources would be most helpful. Um, what, what are you learning about when you're teaching these courses? I don't know that if that connects with what you're asking, Lucy, and I would love to hear more. Um, I'm also happy to get in the nitty gritty with anyone who wants to talk about, you know, why we decided to build our site this way and how we're thinking of building this community. But it, it really starts with you all. Um, it starts with what you are doing across the globe. And uh, this is Catherine. Taylor, can I jump in here and just oh, add, add okay. something? Glad you have a mic. Great. Yes. Yes, I wasn't sure if it would work, but um, thank you. And, and it's really nice to be here online with um, all of these educators excited about social change and solutions journalism. And I just wanted to add that, um, as Taylor mentioned, in my role as manager of the educator community, I work with and support faculty and teachers across disciplines teaching in different subject areas to use solutions journalism stories to uh, teach their, their students and engage their students in learning about social change um, from many different angles. 
But one of the ways in answer to the initial question about how we reach out and how this resource is spreading, it's really the students are so excited about it and so engaged and inspired and it really helps create this shift that we talked about earlier in the mindset from looking at the world sort of through the lens of or the perspective of problems to shifting and saying, you know, and what are the solutions and how do I see myself in the future engaged um, in solving problems? And so I think one of the most exciting things about working with educators um, in this space is the response and the feedback that I'm hearing about how the students respond. So um, anyway, just wanted to add that and uh, thanks for being here. And I added, my omission, I added Catherine's email as well on the page. So you can. So we probably have about five minutes. If you have a question for David or Taylor or Catherine, please feel free to put it in the chat. David, I'm curious, what kinds of things about microfinance did you rethink later? Well, the, the major um, thing that we've learned from microfinance is that um, originally it, 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 people thought, oh, if you give somebody a loan, their economic uh, consumption will go up right away. It will, will change their life in terms of they'll eat better and so forth. And most of the research that really try, has tried to connect microfinance to direct economic, you know, the very quick direct economic uh, uh, benefit has been mixed. There are examples where it does do that, and then there's lots of examples where it doesn't do that. But the surprising thing about microfinance is that despite the fact that researchers for many, many years have been saying it's not helping boost people's um, economic uh, productivity as much as it was hoped, people around the world still keep on taking microloans over and over and over again. So the question is, why do they think it's helpful? And what they have now come to focus on more and more is that there's two real benefits to microfinance. One is that if it's combined with savings, it really does increase long-term assets, um, particularly the savings component is very important. Uh, it creates a discipline. And secondly, you know, th there's a lot of statistics that say that, you know, some percentage of the world lives on a dollar a day or lives on two dollars a day. Well, when you live on a dollar a day, you don't get one, 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 one. You get sort of like three, zero, 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 two, one, zero, zero. So the experience of poverty for the poorest people in the world is extreme uncertainty, especially for those days when you have zero. It's, it's like driving on an extremely bumpy, bumpy road. What they have found is that microfinance can smooth the journey because it's another, it's another source of capital that you can use to sort of, in a sense, um, you know, smooth out your journey. Now, this isn't just like helping you fill in the zeros. It actually reduces your stress when that happens, and it probably has huge health implications that are not yet understood because it's helping to reduce the, the stress that comes with extreme um, unreliability of, of stable sources of income. So those are the new areas. It's quite different than we had thought about at 25 years ago, but it explains why people still won't give up this tool despite the fact that its, it's economic uh, uh, direct benefits are sometimes, uh, sometimes mixed. Fascinating. Uh, Kamal asks, any plans to adapt it for lower grades or lower reading levels? Wow, that's a great question. Um, I, w I would have to defer to Taylor, and but my sense is she's really busy right now. <laughs> Taylor? Yeah, thank you so much. Um, I know we're having a little bit back and forth on chat. Catherine just mentioned the, the great program called News. Ms. Ella. Um, right now, we don't have um, any particular plans to go to grade school, but you never know what the future might hold. Um, and so we're curious to see where things might lead us as we, you know, build up this robust research for universities and high schools and possibly junior high as well, and then see, you know, how might it be helpful and fruitful to um, other grade levels. 
Tutor Mentor Team asks, with a growing number of stories, are you finding a growing number of readers coming back over and over to dig through the library? Do you track this? Yes, actually, we, we do. And, and um, we're seeing now that that's exactly what's happening. We, we don't have a great um, sort of uh, consumer-facing brand, you might say, in terms of like really reaching out to the masses just yet. Uh, but definitely among among educators, um, people are seeing, uh, educators and students, they're seeing that this gets integrated into their reading and also integrated into the way that they do research on a regular basis. Also, we are looking at launching a, a few new different types of story alerts so that not only are people coming back to the site, but also how can we get these stories to you all. And that was one of the biggest pieces of feedback, so we're working on building that out and hoping to launch them next year. So if you want to be part of that process, um, join and we'll have opportunities to test out a couple of new things we're building to hopefully make it better for you all. I feel like this might be a good stopping place, is that okay? Yeah, that would be great. Taylor, do you have any final requests from the community or offers? Yes. Um, first of all, keep doing all the great work that you're doing. Uh, Catherine and I are really excited to connect with each of you and hearing, you know, what are you doing? What resonated with you about this presentation or the work that we're doing with Solution View? And, you know, how, how might we work together? How might um, we support your work? And this community of educators who are committed um, to really supporting the critical thinking and creativity needing to solve the world's problems. Um, how can we sort of come together and do this um, as a community? So we are excited to speak with you. Sign up. Catherine sends out incredible educator newsletters, um, I think monthly, and possibly even in a higher frequency soon. And I can let her talk about that. Um, but we are excited to talk with each of you and hearing your thoughts and how we might work together. And you can sign up for all that stuff just at the solutionsu.org website. Yeah, and I just want to add that when you sign up, sign up as an educator, and then the newsletter that Taylor mentioned um, is, I'm sending it out every three weeks, and um, there's lots of information in there about, about the resources, how teachers are using them, so ideas for assignments, and um, in creating teaching resources, teaching materials. So um, I'd love to uh, have, you all, um, have you all on board and part of the um, educator community. Hey, thanks, David. Thanks, Taylor. Thanks, Catherine. This is really fun. So glad you did this. Well, thank you, and, and please do send us your feedback. Like I say, this is being built. Uh, it's just fresh off the presses. So if you uh, use it, how are you using it? How could it be better? These are the kinds of things that will really help us and help, help us help others as well. Okay, thanks, everybody. We are in the closing two hours of our conference. Uh, we just did the numbers and we had 4,300 people sign up from 138 countries. We're just so excited. We are all tired and ready, <laughs> ready to finish, but we're going to have a short party at the end. Thanks again to the Solutions U team. Thanks to all of you for coming. There are, sessions, there are two sessions coming up in the next hour. We hope you'll, you'll join one of them. And then please have a great day. Bye now. Thank you, Steve. Thank you, Lucy. Thank you.